six o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining. This meeting is being recorded, so we'll send you the complete recording of the workshop afterwards. For anyone that's just joining, I'm asking you to write your name in the chat so I know who's here. So just type in your name and then we're doing a fun little get to know each other. Um, no judgment here, but I'm asking you to share your something that might be considered unhealthy food, snack item. Feel free to share brands or get specific. And we're going to use this a little bit later in the workshop. We're going to talk about healthy swaps. So if you're interested in finding out about a healthy alternative for something that you think might be unhealthy, I highly encourage you to share that. So tonight is our free monthly food and mood workshop. Uh, and today I'm joined with Dr. Nishi Bhopal and our nurse practitioner, Josh Habinski, will be joining us as well. And my name is Ilar, and I'm the nutritionist at Pacific Integrative Psychiatry. All right, so tonight's topic is nutrition, inflammation, and mental health. So if you've been joining us for the past couple of workshops, we've done different topics, things like anxiety, depression, ADHD. If you feel like those topics maybe didn't relate to you or maybe they didn't apply to you, I guarantee that inflammation is something that most of us have probably experienced during the course of our lives. And you'll understand why as we talk a little bit more about it, but we're, we're going to get into a little bit more detail about how inflammation affects our mental health and how the way we eat can impact inflammation. All right. And then just a little bit of information about our practice. So I always like to go over this and it might be review for some of you have, who have attended before, but here's what makes our practice really unique and what causes us to kind of take a more holistic approach through our uh, practice here at Pacific Integrative Psychiatry. I actually had a patient the other day ask me, well, why would I go see a functional medicine provider versus my GI specialist versus my PCP? What's the difference and what, what can that do for me or how can that benefit me? And I love this question because I love explaining to people what functional medicine is and how it can help them take a different approach to their health. So in an integrative approach, or a functional medicine approach, we try to not only look at your symptoms, but we try to figure out why they're happening. So it allows us to dig a little bit deeper. We look for root cause. Uh, we analyze your history, you know, when your symptoms started, how they became chronic, how they're related to other symptoms you might be having physically, mentally. We look at things like sleep, exercise, your relationships, um, prior infections or medication use that you might have had. And then we also offer really unique laboratory testing that gives us even more information as far as what's going on within your body, your metabolism, your digestive system. So we offer psychiatry um, with Dr. Nishi Bhopal and our nurse practitioner, Josh Habinski. And this involves medication management and integrative forms of treatment. Uh, we also offer psychotherapy and coaching. And we have a therapist here, um, Andrew, who recently joined, and he's also accepting new clients. And then I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, for nutrition consultations um, through a functional medicine approach. And then we offer laboratory testing that also looks at things like your gut microbiome, stool studies, um, blood tests, urine analysis that can also look at your nutritional or vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Um, if you're new to our workshops, um, we typically have these once a month on the third or fourth Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you join late or if you're not able to join live, don't worry, we'll send you a complete recording afterwards through your email so you can watch everything. We highly encourage you to participate. You can write your questions or comments in the chat as we go. Or if you feel comfortable, you can turn on your video, your audio and ask your questions at the end. Uh, and then lastly, please respect everyone's privacy in case someone shares something personal on here and then try to minimize distractions as we go. All right, so just a check-in from last workshop. So last month's workshop was about nutrition and anxiety. So we talked about what kinds of foods might worsen anxiety, what kinds of foods might lower anxiety levels or anxiety-related symptoms. And we also talked about 
how it's not just about what you eat, but when and how you eat. So some people mentioned skipping meals like breakfast. So for anyone that was there last month, I'm curious to know, did you try an experiment, something new, and how did it go? So if you can share in the chat or if you feel comfortable sharing with your audio or video, um, let me know what your experiment was and how it went. I can share um, while we're waiting for people to answer. So actually one of my experiments, I almost do the same, well, it's kind of the same thing <laughs> most months, which is trying to get more protein, um, especially as a vegetarian. Um, uh, that's something I have to be consistent with and um, mindful of. So definitely eating more protein helps me feel more satisfied and have more energy during the day. Um, I don't get hungry as quickly. Um, so this is a good reminder. I'm going to keep being mindful of protein. Um, and then the other one too is not skipping breakfast because sometimes I can do that as well and get busy in the morning. Um, but even just having a little bit of like a high protein um, small breakfast can make a big difference with how the day goes. Yeah, I love that. I was just kind of sharing mine too in the chat. I I too, every month I try to focus on the protein, especially for breakfast. And I recently over the past um I would say year or so I eat primarily vegetarian. So it's definitely harder to try and incorporate more plant-based sources of high protein foods, and then trying to be consciously mindful of that, especially for breakfast, trying to, you know, get variety, but at the same time, a good, good amount of protein to start your day. And I definitely agree. It makes a difference going into your day, your energy levels, your hunger levels, your cravings, your mood and everything. And we talked about how our mood can be affected by our blood sugar levels, the types of foods that we eat. It can make us more irritable, less um, able to focus throughout our workday as well. So if anyone tried any other experiments, let us know in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye out as we go along. Um, yeah, Nader said burgers. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a good one for um, healthy food swaps that we can also talk about um, options for fast food burgers. I know I saw French fries in there and I mentioned that as well. So we can keep that in mind for uh, later on in the workshop. All right, so here's where we're going to be going today and what we're going to be talking about. So we'll kind of review the gut brain connection and how the way we eat or our nutrition can impact our mental health. We'll also talk about what foods can worsen inflammation versus what nutrients can actually help reduce inflammation. And then we'll do a monthly experiment again, something you can try at home, and then we'll end with a Q&A. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and, and I see one more answer, Gazal. Uh, I also am actively trying to include protein in all of my meals since I'm vegan and it can be slightly more difficult, but definitely doable once you make a conscious effort. Yeah, I agree. It's like you have to write it down and keep everything stocked in the fridge or pantries at all times. So I think that conscious effort is so important. All right, Nishi. So I'll let you take over. Okay, well, thank you, Ilar, for kicking us off. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Welcome. So this is interactive as we go along. If you have any questions, comments, anything to share, please do so either in the chat or feel free to come on the video and share. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so we're talking about inflammation and mental health. So um, I think uh, so a couple things before we jump into that, uh, what we're talking about today is not medical advice. So if you have specific questions about your medical conditions, please talk to your healthcare practitioner. Um, and we're not going to go into detail about diagnosis and treatment. So again, if that's something you'd like to explore, you can um, schedule to work with us one on one or talk to your healthcare practitioner. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of this research is still emerging. It's still new. Um you know, there's limited research on nutrition and inflammation um, and mental health. So we're sharing what the evidence shows so far, and this may be changing. So at the time of this recording, it's July 2023. And who knows if you're watching this down the line, the, the research might have changed by then, but we're going to be talking about what is known so far. So Ilar, let's talk about the connection between inflammation and mental health, maybe first by explaining what inflammation is, is inflammation always a bad thing? Um, what are we actually talking about when we say inflammation? 
Yeah. So I know the term inflammation can get kind of used very frequently and people just kind of throw the term inflammation around, but it's really important to understand why inflammation happens and what our body is trying to do in that process. So basically when we think of inflammation, we might think of, um, you know, redness on our skin an inflamed spot. We actually think of rises in the skin, elevations, things like that. And it's something that actually requires our body's attention, but it's our body's way of healing itself. So it's giving its attention to an area where they, there might be an infection for an object. For example, if you get something stuck in the skin, um, in cases where people might have cancer, you know, that can cause inflammation in the body, but it's actually our body's way of doing its job. And it's okay for our body to respond through the inflammatory response. But what can happen is if this progresses, so if the inflammatory cells continue to do their work over longer period of, periods of time, then it can become chronic. So we can start to see uh, negative effects physically and also mentally, which so many chronic conditions now are associated with inflammation. And this is because the inflammatory response progressed for so long, and now it's starting to have a negative health impact. So inflammation can start as a good thing, and it's really important for our body's response mechanism, but it can become a bad thing over time. So that's important to remember that inflammation is normal, right? Like that, that's how our bodies stay healthy, as you said. Um, but when it becomes prolonged and chronic, that's when um, we can start to run into issues. And we know about inflammation and cardiovascular disease, that there's a strong connection there, inflammation, and metabolic disease, there's, of course, inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and things like this. But what's the connection with mental health? Um, mm -hmm. And what do we what do we know? And Josh, feel free to chime in as well. But um, and, you know, I, I can share some of the research as well. But Ilar, maybe you can, you can start. Um, what's the connection between inflammation and mental health? And when we talk about mental health, we're talking about like a big umbrella of conditions. Mm -hmm. So depression, anxiety, psychosis, bipolar disorder. Um, but what's the link? Yeah. So, you know, we know that the gut brain connection is really strong. So when inflammation occurs, uh, it's basically starting in one place and probably spreading out throughout the body. So when inflammation occurs in one area, the attention goes to that area, but when it progresses, it can start to spread and the inflammation can progress. So for example, if the inflammation starts in the gut, in your digestive tract, let's say you have a bacterial infection, you have an overgrowth of bad bacteria that require your body's inflammatory response, but then the bacteria continue to stay there. They go untreated. Um, there's no changes really in your diet lifestyle approach to heal the body and lower the inflammation response, then this can progress. So the bacteria can stop producing a healthy environment, which is needed to produce neurotransmitters, hormones that affect our mental health. So we start to see a really big connection between digestive issues and also mental health issues. So things Things like IBS and depression or anxiety are highly correlated and linked. And a lot of times we see people with higher anxiety le levels or people who tend to feel more depressed have more digestive issues or vice versa. People who have more digestive issues tend to feel more anxious or depressed. So um, there's that strong link and connection. And I would say the way you eat can definitely help the inflammatory response. And we'll talk a little bit later about that. But Josh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well. So yeah, um, so it is a big topic, obviously. Um, but just like Dr. Bhopal was saying, inflammation has been um, pretty much implicated in many, if not all of the chronic health issues that we deal with um, in the United States and globally, and that includes mental illness. Um, lots of studies do show that in people who struggle with mental health issues, whether that's depression, anxiety, psychotic disorders, bipolar disorder, in general, those symptoms are associated with higher levels of inflammation. And that can be measured in different ways. We can look at things in the blood like um, markers, C-reactive protein, different interleukins, TNF-alpha. Um, and so uh, oftentimes when we're thinking about the, the root cause of mental health issues, at least in kind of the conventional sense, we think of neurotransmitters. We think of what's called the monoamine hypothesis. So that's 
for depression, that's kind of the hypothesis that depression is associated with low levels of serotonin. Um, there, there has been more evidence that has come out that's, that it's much more complicated than that. Um, and there's actually an alternative hypothesis called the cytokine hypothesis of depression. And that's basically, um, those researchers have shown that depression is very much associated with depression and, and that inflammation can be a root cause. Um, and that's just one example. There are so many different ways that, um, that inflammation can be, um, associated with mental health issues. That's such a great explanation. And, um, yeah, it's just so interesting to see what the, you know, how the research is, is emerging on this. And so one thing to clarify is that not everyone with depression has inflammation, right? So it's not that depression is always caused by inflammation, but it can be caused by inflammation. People who have inflammation have a higher um, rate of higher incidence of depression. Um, And then we do know there's a subset of people with depression who have inflammation, who have like inflammation as a root cause. So you can have people with depression and there's thought to be like a subtype of like inflammatory depression and then um, another subtype that maybe isn't caused by inflammation. So that's an important distinction because for the people who have depression caused by inflammation, the treatments may be different and they may be less responsive to some of the traditional medications like SSRIs that that we might use um, in conventional medicine to treat depression. Um, So let's talk a little bit more about the gut and inflammation, you sort of alluded to that. So what is the gut brain connection? Can you explain a little bit more about why that's important and why it's important to think about healing the gut when we are um, working on our mental health? Yeah. So, you know, the gut brain connection is really important because everything that we eat, even if you take a medication, it technically is going through your digestive tract and the digestive tract and the GI tract actually starts in the mouth. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, the small intestine, large intestine, the stomach, but it's actually in your mouth. So from the moment that you take the supplement, you take the medication or you eat the food, your digestive tract starts to do its work. And if you can imagine inflammation could be spread all throughout the body from your brain, all the way down to your gut, um, your skin, your bones. And what can happen is in the gut specifically, the inflammation can start to actually affect the environment or the microbiome of the gut. And the microbiome just refers to a variety of different microbes, bacteria that might be present there. And what also happens is it can affect the ratios of the different types of bacteria that are in there. So if you can imagine the inflammation causes a poor, worse environment, this is better or preferred by the bad bacteria and the good bacteria can't really survive in that unhealthy environment. So we see an overgrowth of the bad bacteria, which doesn't allow us to first properly digest our food. So we're not extracting the right nutrients that even though we're maybe eating healthier, we're not able to properly extract these nutrients. We can't get the vitamins, the minerals that we need. And these are used to actually help our mental health because they allow us to generate energy. So ATP, and they allow us to generate hormones, neurotransmitters like serotonin that Josh mentioned, which can impact our mood, our mental health, and it can be associated with happier moods when we have more serotonin um, just in the body. And what can happen with inflammation as well is it can put us at greater risk of having things like leaky gut. And a way of thinking about leaky gut is kind of like a screen door that you would use to keep out bugs, you know, insects, things like that. If you can think of this screen door as your gut lining, as the inflammation worsens and as your um, gut starts to become impacted by the inflammation, the screen door is not going to be as strong. So you're going to have holes. You might allow some of the good bacteria to get out and some of the bad bacteria or microbes to get in. So that's what affects the gut environment over time. And if you imagine the inflammation is chronic now, this is really going to allow the environment to become unhealthy and it's harder to reverse or go back to the healthier environment that it once was. Um, So, you know, we talked about poor digestion, poor absorption of nutrients, which can also lead to things like 
irritable bowel syndrome, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, even things like food sensitivities people start to experience. And if you imagine if you're not able to properly digest your food, or if you constantly suffer from things like abdominal pain, constipation, bloating, indigestion after your meals or throughout the day, this can really take a toll on your mental health too. So if you imagine you're at work and you don't really know if the next thing you're going to eat is going to cause your digestive symptoms to flare up. It can cause you to not be able to perform well at work, um, maybe even be able to go out, socialize with friends, family members. So I think, you know, it can affect our mental health through the production of hormones and neurotransmitters, but the inflammation and the damage to the gut can also really affect us mentally through our work, our social interactions, and just our day to day. That's really helpful. And, and so just taking a step back, um, we're going to talk in a second about foods that can trigger inflammation, because of course, what we eat has a big impact on our gut health. And then, um, you know, food provides the building blocks for nutrients for our body to synthesize neurotransmitters and hormones and things. So we'll talk about that in a second. But what are some non food causes of inflammation that people should be looking out for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So stress is a big one. Um, I know a lot of us experience stress on a day to day, but what can happen is chronic stress or, you know, periods where we actually go through traumatic life events that really affect affect us physically and mentally. So the body can be put under a state of stress and it can just linger on and it can cause the inflammatory response to become activated initially, but also continue to um, stay activated and become more chronic. Uh, sleep deprivation or poor sleep quality, we all know. And as we talked about in a previous workshop, sleep is the foundation of our health, right? And if we don't have good sleep quality, how is our body able to function and do everything that it needs to do? So that can worsen inflammation, lack of physical activity and exercise as well. So when we're less physically active, if you imagine your body's circulatory system, for example, your blood circulation tends to slow down, you're more sedentary you're not moving as much versus someone who is more active walking around, not even talking about vigorous exercise, but just going for walks or getting your 10,000 steps in a day. Those are also physical activities that can help reduce inflammation. Um, so stress, you know, sleep quality, exercise. Um, and Josh, I'd love to hear your thoughts more on uh, other factors as well. Yeah, you covered a lot of them. Um, I would say certain medications can definitely affect both the um, the gut microbiome in terms of diversity um, and also the integrity of, of the gut lining, like you talked about earlier with leaky gut. And so certain medications, I think like NSAIDs, so anti-inflammatory um, medications can be particularly rough on the gut um, and lead to intestinal permeability. Um, alcohol is huge. It both um, completely disrupts the gut microbiome in terms of the, um, the bacteria in the gut, um, and the balance, but also again, the, the permeability of the, the gut membrane. Um, yeah, so those are, those are some big things. And then even certain, certain, we'll talk about foods, but, but like sugar, 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 like really, really tough on the microbiome and artificial sweeteners, um, kind of find out more and more about how certain artificial sweeteners can really disrupt the gut microbiome. These are great reminders because a lot of these things that cause inflammation are things that we can, um, do something about, right? Stress, there's strategies to manage stress, um, you know, meditation, yoga, breath work, seeing a therapist, um, alcohol, right? Being mindful and, and minimizing use of alcohol, um, even using, you know, overusing medications, like Josh said, um, kind of reevaluating what you're taking and putting into your body. And then of course there's environmental toxins, so ex exposure to like chemicals and fumes, um, plastics, these kinds of things can also contribute, um, infections as well. And then sleep, you know, sleep is something that um, I love talking about, I'm passionate about, and um, sleep is fundamental. And that's when our body repairs itself. So if you don't get enough sleep, or if you have poor sleep quality, um, you're not able to 
um, to heal and repair, and that's going to prolong these issues with inflammation. But today we're also talking about diet, of course, and foods that contribute to inflammation. So let's jump into that. What are some foods um, that are common that people are likely eating um, that could be contributing to inflammation? Yeah, and I know we saw some of the comments earlier on in the chat box of food swaps that we're going to talk about later, but a lot of the foods that we see in fast food restaurants, definitely, and also foods that we see on the shelves, majority of the grocery store is going to be covered in processed and packaged foods. And, you know, there's just one section dedicated to fresh produce, you know, you might have your meats there as well. So highly processed foods are the number one, I would say they're going to be high in refined sugars and starches or carbohydrates. So for example, you might see things like enriched white flour as one of the first ingredients for so many products that tend to be processed and packaged. And this is just artificially made, meaning that this flour has been refined and processed so many times that it's been depleted of its nutrients. And then later on in that list, you'll see a list of nutrients that have been added back in. So buying whole grain, whole wheat products tends to eliminate this step. So you're getting the pure form of the flour versus the artificially made form um, that's been enriched with additional nutrients. Uh, processed foods also include things like processed meats, um, again, refined sugars, you know, sodas, uh, pastries, donuts, things like that. Uh, and then also uh, certain types of oils that tend to be more inflammatory. So the trans fats or inflammatory oils include things like peanut oil, corn oil, soybean oil, canola oil, safflower oil. These are just some examples. And you'll see these very commonly in things like potato chips, or we talked about French fries. And at a lot of restaurants or fast food restaurants, they're probably not going to use extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil for frying your food. Um, first, because it's probably more expensive, but second, because it's not going to taste the same. So the reason people like these foods is because they like these oils when they've been fried and used in these ways. But what happens is these oils are actually highly inflammatory, especially when they're cooked with at high temperatures. Um, and that's exactly what we do when we fry foods or when we make burgers, French fries, donuts, things like that. They have to be deep fried. They're trying to cook as much food as possible in a short period of time. So the cooking time is shortened, temperatures are higher and these oils, their structure isn't very stable at these high temperatures and they can become highly inflammatory when we consume them. Plus our body tends to crave more of these foods. As we know, the more we eat, of, eat something, the more we tend to crave it or like it. Um, and then you also mentioned alcohol. So, you know, the alcohol can actually increase the body's stress response. It can increase the inflammatory response, and it can even act as a toxin in the body when consumed in excess. So if you're consuming alcohol beverages several times during the week, um, you know, having multiple beverages during the day. So this can also be really inflammatory and it can uh, be even toxic for the body. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of these foods that you're describing, they're part of the standard American diet, right? The sad <laughs> diet um, because they're convenient. And even at your grocery store, like if you like a simple thing like salad dressing, even if you go to a health food store, you go to Whole Foods and you think you're buying like a nice, healthy brand of, of salad dressing, it's still made with like these refined seed oils, right? It's really hard to find something that's made of um, organic olive oil. Um, and that's a simple swap that we can talk about, um, just kind of making your own dressing at home, which is super simple to do. Um, Josh, if you have anything to add, um, feel free to chime in with regard to inflammatory foods, but you did mention sugar. Um, and that's a big one. And sugar is in so many things, right? Like if you look at a rest, um, ingredients label, you might not even recognize that there is sugar in there because there is so many other names for it. Um, so Ilar, maybe you could share what are some other names of, of sugars that people should look out for when they're reading a, a ingredient label? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we, we do see, um, refined sugar, white sugar, cane sugar, um, brown sugar, brown rice syrup. Um, I know high fructose corn syrup is common. Um, there's even sugar substitutes now that people just assume is a healthier option. So, um, you know, things like stevia, monk fruit, they might be used as alternatives, um, because they don't spike your blood sugars in the same way. Um, but the sweeteners can also come from, um, like dextrose, um, inulin, which are more forms of fiber that are used in products that are sweetened. Um, but again, you know, the, the list is very long and I know we can, we can write it in the chat and we've, we've done this before in the past too, but it's, it's hard to know exactly every single one I would say that comes into a label, but whatever ingredient comes first is going to be largest in quantity in the product that you're getting. And I would say looking for more unrefined forms of sugar. So focusing more on the sugars that might be healthier, I would say would probably be an easier focus for most people. So like dates, you know, maple syrup, um, unrefined coconut sugar, I would say those are some of the main ones that would be healthier and less inflammatory. Right. And then I'll also just mention that um, because Josh mentioned before, there are certain markers that you can check to see if what your levels of inflammation are like. And as we were discussing, um, there is that connection between inflammation and mental health and not everyone who has depression or anxiety has inflammation. But if you have inflammation, it, it may be harder to treat depression and anxiety and you'll be at a higher risk for it. So there are certain markers like, um, CRP or C reactive protein that we check in our practice. And so if people are interested in, um, taking a deeper dive to see what is really going on under the surface, um, that is something that we can help with. Um, but super helpful to hear about the different names of sugars and things. I think that's just an important one to, to emphasize because it's just so pervasive. And I always look for, if I, if I am buying, I try to avoid packaged things, but if I am buying something that's packaged, I look for as few ingredients as possible um, because the more ingredients they are, the, the there are, the more likely it is to be um, artificially you know, processed and things and inflammatory. Um, okay, so let's talk about food swaps. Uh, so in the chat earlier, we asked people what are their favorite junk foods. Um, and again, I think it's important not to think about foods in terms of good and bad. Um, you know, like it's okay to indulge once in a while to go to a restaurant, have some French fries, you know, have a piece of cake once in a while. That's okay. We're not saying you should never do that. But on the whole, we want to really nourish our bodies and brains with, with foods that are going to be healing. So let's talk about food swaps. People mentioned uh, burger, hamburger. What's a good swap for that? Um, French fries. And then I think donuts and then ice cream were the ones mm -hmm. that came up. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you mentioned something really important. And I think having that healthy relationship or knowing that the, these foods can become bad only when you're consuming them, you know, regularly all the time, they're a common part of your diet. Let's say you have some health issues that actually require you to eat less of these foods, but you're eating more of them. Um, and I think, you know, as far as the fast food, things like French fries, hamburgers, it, it might not taste quite the same, but finding these healthier swaps and alternatives over time, you know, you're serving your body well, you're attending to your cravings, the foods that you want to eat. So for example, something like French fries, you know, um, having sweet potatoes instead, which are higher in fiber, they have things like beta carotene, which is important for our skin, our vision, and you can actually roast these in the oven yourself. So instead of going to a fast food restaurant, getting French fries that might be highly, you know, higher in oils, deep fried and things like peanut oil, you know, canola oil, corn oil, you can actually make the sweet potatoes at home yourself using things like avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil. You can roast them at slow, um, at lower temperatures for a longer time. So maybe you just put it in the oven, 350 degrees, and you really allow it to sit there for about 30 minutes and it gets crispy, you know, you can make your own dipping sauce at home, like, you know, plant-based sauces with like cashews, things like that. And I've seen a lot of those on the internet that look really good. So I think you always have to give it a chance. So a lot of times people are like, there's no way that's not going to taste good. <laughs> you know, that's not French fries, but when you give it a chance and when you try it, it can actually taste really good. And if it's serving you well, and it's helping your gut health, your mental health, I would say, why not try it? 
Uh, for the burgers, you know, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, these are made with red meat, obviously, and they tend to be, you know, more processed types of meats. And it's harder to say if the restaurant is buying, you know, a lean type of grass fed meat that's going to be healthier, more lean for you. But you can do a plant based alternative. Let's say you try a black bean burger, or maybe you try turkey burger, right? If you really want to have the meat, um, you can do a turkey burger and you can even make it at home. So you can put it together yourself, or some restaurants have options for alternatives that you might be able to choose. Uh, you can even choose a plant based source of cheese, or you can substitute the cheese for, let's say, avocado hummus, a different dip that might be higher in fiber, healthy fats, omega-3 fatty acids. And for the bun, you you can have the bun. I would say, you know, it's completely okay to eat bread. I don't want there to be, you know, some negative <laughs> energy towards having bread. But let's say sometimes maybe you have a wrap or like an almond flour tortilla, or we have tortillas nowadays that are made from things like chickpeas. So the tortilla is going to be much lower in flour, carbohydrates. It's going to even contain some protein, maybe even some fiber if you choose the chickpea flour wraps. So you can make yourself a little plant-based or turkey burger wrap with some avocado, maybe some cashew cheese, which to me, it sounds really good. So I think you, you just have to be open to it. And then the last one, donuts. So again, donuts are okay to eat, you know, let's say once a week, a couple times a month, maybe you just decide to treat yourself to a donut. I typically don't recommend having it first thing in the morning, because as we've talked about in previous workshops, it's going to spike your blood sugars and the rest of your day is going to be followed by those elevations and, you know, drops in the blood sugars. Maybe you try a homemade pastry. So maybe you try a new recipe. You're going to for sure be using less ingredients. You have the option of choosing your own flour, the sugars that go in, uh, the types of milk, you know, butter, dairy products that you might be using. Maybe you add in some fresh fruit in there. You can make a healthy scone, right? Let's say maybe you try that instead. And I would say sometimes it's just that craving for the sugars first thing in the morning that we want. And when we swap it for something else, and it actually helps us get that sugar in the body without the donut, without the fried foods, um, then we're not craving it as much. Super helpful. I'm getting hungry now. I think it's dinner time. <laughs> so that all sounded really good. Um, okay, someone also, Sherry also mentioned ice cream. What do you think about um, healthy swaps for that? Yeah. So, you know, for the ice cream, I would say a couple different things. So first, if you're craving the sugars, again, having something sweet. So uh, sometimes people like to do, uh, one of my patients said they like to do plain Greek yogurt with frozen blueberries. So something like that, where you're combining something that's frozen, cold with something that has protein. Um, some people like to make their own ice cream, you know, in a blender, it's called like nice cream, you know, when you put some frozen bananas, maybe you put a little bit of milk, um, you can put yogurt. I've even seen desserts made from things like cottage cheese, which is also going to have higher amounts of protein. There are healthier ice creams out there. So just like you mentioned, Nishi, looking at the ingredient list is so important. And so I've seen ice creams out there with five ingredients, and then I've seen ice creams out there with 10, 20 ingredients. So just because something is labeled keto, you know, vegan, gluten-free doesn't make it healthier. Or let's say there's ice creams out there that are advertised now for being lower in calories that can sometimes be deceiving. So looking for lower ingredients, let's say it just says, you know, milk, sugar, whatever type of fruit that you like to have, you know, those ingredients, you're familiar with them. There's very few of them. You could put that together at home yourself because you know, these ingredients. So, you know, and I've seen plant-based types of ice creams out there. I just tried one the other day. Um, I think it was called like Van, Van Leeuwen, um, it's a company based, I think in New York, and they made these really awesome plant-based ice cream bars that were so good. And I had everyone, you know, my family try it and they all liked it. So again, just giving it a chance and looking for those healthy alternatives, you might be surprised. Great ideas. And if anyone has requests for a food swap idea, um, go ahead and put it in the chat or you can um, pop on here and ask, what about potato chips? I, I love a savory, crunchy snack. So what would you suggest? 
Yeah. So for the potato chips, again, if you really just want the potato chip, then look for a healthier alternative. I've seen potato chips out there with uh, potatoes, you know, avocado oil, sea salt, just three ingredients. And again, we know that avocado oil is much healthier when it's used at higher temperatures. It's not inflammatory. Uh, other alternatives are things like, um, I know some people like to have popcorn instead. So there's healthy options for popcorn. Um, I've seen ingredient lists with just popcorn, coconut oil, sea salt. Um, if you're craving something crunchy, there's crackers. So um, I've seen crackers that are made with almond flour. Um, you know, they're made with almond flour, sea salt, just very little minimal ingredients that gives you your crunch and it gives you your saltiness without the high amounts of oil or um, the potato chips that might be a bit more processed. But again, looking for the shorter list of ingredients versus even popcorns and potato chips that might have a long list of ingredients because there are certain flavors. You might swap your own dip for it, right? Find a healthy dip. So if you like that flavor, get the healthier chip and then use your own dip to get the flavor of the potato chip. Those are some really great suggestions. And I think an important thing is to have fun with it. Um, it, it doesn't need to feel stressful. You don't want to feel, you know, really stressed and worried. Oh my gosh, this food is inflammatory and need to eat anti-inflammatory foods because th that can actually create more stress, right? And more inflammation. <laughs> so it can become this vicious cycle. So you really let it be nourishing, let it be fun. Um, I've been, one of the things I love is chocolate and I love a dessert. And I found this really super simple keto recipe for like a chocolate cake. And it's like a single serving. You just make it in the microwave. It's just almond flour, cocoa powder, like unsweetened, there's no sugar in it. Well, a few chocolate chips, but there's a little, little bit of sugar in those. Um, and then like a little bit of butter and, and milk. And um, you just like whip it up and microwave it. And it's so delicious. And it really hits the spot. And it's it's easy, right? So you want to make this easy for you so you can inc easily incorporate it into your daily routines um, and, and just let it be really fun. And even with the, the dips, um, taking some Greek yogurt and mixing it with like sriracha is like a really fun dip. I made that the other day or mixing it with like, um, like an achar, which is like an Indian pickle, um, makes a nice sauce. So you can really experiment and, and then, you know, have fun with it. Um, we're kind of coming up on the 45 minute mark. Is there anything else that either of you would like to add or any questions that um, people have? Um, one just, quick. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Yeah. Uh, one quick thing. So I, I think, um, Ilar did such a great job at, um, at going over the kind of like the universally, um, potentially inflammatory foods. Um, I kind of, I work with people also, and I know Ilar does on also, expanding if, if somebody does have symptoms that that are bothering them whether it's you know mental health or physical there can be other foods that for most people are super anti-inflammatory that for for one reason or another it could be an allergy it could be a sensitivity um it could be like a histamine response to certain foods and all of those things can actually create inflammation too and for that um you know you can kind of figure that out, figure that out by doing a, like a very systematic elimination diet. Um, and also there are a couple companies in general, I'm not a huge fan of food sensitivity testing because they only look at like one marker. That's not very accurate, but there are a couple tests on the market that do a much better job at looking at, um, potential inflammatory, um, sources of, of foods. Yeah, I, I really like that because, you know, I, a lot of the patients that we do see do have some sort of food sensitivity or, you know, allergy, some of them know it from prior history or prior doctors that they've seen, but a lot of them don't know it. And, you know, going through an elimination process by yourself can be very tedious because you don't know what foods to eliminate. You don't know how to incorporate them back in. You don't know how to heal the gut while you're waiting to incorporate the food back in. So I think that's why it's important to work with someone as you're going through the process um, and then incorporating the anti-inflammatory foods, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, fiber rich diet, which helps support the gut lining. Uh, fruits and vegetables, whole grain products we talked about, 
And then also antioxidant rich foods, which can also help with fighting inflammation, uh, berries, dark leafy greens, um, even spices, you know, you might consider things like turmeric, ginger, saffron, which can be really fun to cook with, or, you know, making yourself like a little turmeric latte in the morning or before bed. So, you know, I, again, just like Nishi mentioned, it has to work for you and it has to be something that's doable for you. So making it simple, making it easy, starting with one area at a time. And then if you uh, feel the need to work with someone, or if you really are looking for those recommendations, the testing that Josh mentioned, that can really help guide you in the right direction. Um, you can visit our website, which I'll put on the screen in just a moment. So I'm going to share my screen again um, as we wrap up. Okay, so again, we end with a monthly experiment. So something you can try at home. So this month we talked about inflammation, nutrition, mental health. So maybe your goal is to eliminate an inflammatory food. So we talked about things like donuts, burgers, French fries, uh, you know, foods that are high in refined sugars and starches. So for anyone that's here, uh, during the workshop right now, I'm curious to know if you have something in mind, let us know in the chat or if you want to come on video or audio, what is the experiment that you want to try? And then we ask you to come back next month and share with us how it went. Um, I have another example here, maybe eat more omega-3 rich nutrients. Omega-3 fatty acids are really important for fighting inflammation, lowering inflammation. Examples are things like avocados, you know, wild fish like salmon, sardines. Uh, you can even do plant based sources of omega 3s like avocados, olive oil, variety of nuts and seeds like chia seeds, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, hemp seeds, things like that. Um, so if anyone has an experiment, let us know in the chat. I'm going to move on just because we're, we are shorter on time. All right. So just to recap of what we talked about today. So we talked about the gut brain connection and the importance of nutrition on our mental health and also lowering inflammation or how nutrition can actually worsen inflammation. So we talked about specific foods um, like burgers, you know, French fries, fried foods, fast foods, things like that. And we also talked about nutrients to help reduce inflammation, like fiber rich foods, antioxidant rich foods, omega 3 fatty acids. Um, and one more thing I'll add in is hydration. So I know we talked about alcohol, um, sometimes caffeine for people, but staying hydrated is also really important, drinking enough water. And then we talked about our monthly experiment. Um, so uh, Nishi said, we'll work on reducing sugar intake. Yeah. And I think that's a big one, just like how we talked about sugar is in most products that you see in the grocery store, in the aisles, things that are uh, packaged, processed are likely going to contain some form of sugar, um, having that list with you. So you know what to look out for. It can be helpful. All right. If anyone has any questions, let us know in the chat. Here's the website here for checking out our practice. Um, so Josh and I are accepting new clients. If you're interested in working with us through an integrative approach and you're really curious about how, uh, you know, your nutrition, your diet could be impacting your mental health or vice versa, um, you can check out our website and you can schedule a free discovery call. Um, and then one more thing I'll mention is that in September, we are starting uh, a program. So this is going to be a paid program. I know we've been having these workshops for free, but this is going to be a month long month long program. And it's about how you can utilize nutrition for lowering anxiety. So we'll have supportive group environments, we'll provide really unique resources, handouts, tools that you can use. Um, and I'll be hosting the group myself. And we'll have, you know, a Facebook group that you can get connected with other people. Um, yes, the week uh, the program is four weeks long, so we'll be meeting live over Zoom once a week, um, and then you can check in throughout the week. We'll utilize goal setting, you know, changes in your diet, um, the food mood connection. We'll really dig deeper into that. Um, so stay tuned for more details that are going to be coming. But again, this is going to be a paid program uh, course that we're going to be having in September, and it's going to be a four week long program. 
And we have our email here if anyone has questions um, or is interested in suggesting topics for the future. So it's hello at pacificintegrativepsych.com. And then our website again is pacificintegrativepsych.com down here. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Nishi. It's good to see you guys. Um, and I hope to see everyone again next month. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.